Welcome to Roll for Crit. I'm here to give you my review of Marvel Champions, The Mad Titan's Shadow. This is the newest expansion box for the Marvel Champions LCG from Fantasy Flight. It includes two brand new heroes and five villain scenarios. It's just rolling out to retailers right now, so maybe you've already got your hands on it or you are just about to. I'm gonna give you a breakdown of what comes inside the box and then give you some of my thoughts on how it all works together. There is a campaign in this one, just like with the Rise of Red Skull and the Guardians box that came before it, Galaxy's Most Wanted. So you can play through all five scenarios in order and acquire campaign cards as you go, or you can just play them on and off as standalone scenarios as you like. So let's talk about the heroes that come in this one first. You have Adam Warlock and Spectrum. Adam Warlock is very interesting in terms of the build of his deck because there are four different types of cards in Marvel Champions, and usually a hero deck is limited to just one of those. There have been some exceptions. Adam Warlock requires you to have an even amount of each type. So a fourth of your deck must be aggression, a fourth of your deck must be justice, and so on. And that's because his special abilities all revolve around getting different types of cards out of there. Uh, in particular, his personal ability printed on his hero card allows you to spend a card from your hand, just discard it, and depending on what type it was, it'll have an effect. For instance, aggression will do some damage. Uh, I think that's pretty interesting because he doesn't even need to really play cards or spend resources necessarily to have a positive effect on the game. He can just say what's in his hand. It's like, oh, I can't afford to play this. Well, I can still just spend it right now for two attack damage if I want to. And a lot of his cards also have to do with flipping things off the top of his deck. And for each different type you get, some kind of a better effect will happen. For that reason, you're probably going to be going through his deck a lot more than you normally would in a Marvel Champions game. And there's a couple cards that take advantage of that. In particular, there's Soul World, which is really interesting because when your deck runs out, you put a counter on it and you can you spend that counter when you would like to fully heal Adam Warlock. So it's a card that at first I thought, what's the point of this? I'm not going to go through my deck that fast. That doesn't seem worth it, uh, but it's pretty cheap and you potentially just get a full heal for very little. So that's kind of a cool benefit. He also has some cards that will go inside of the encounter deck. So you'll be able to draw those on future turns, and rather than facing some kind of a penalty, they'll give you a bonus. So really cool support stuff going on there. Uh, then you have Spectrum, and Spectrum's gimmick is that she has three different forms, and each form uh, increases her stats and abilities in a certain area. So attack, attacking, thwarting, and healing, essentially, or defending. And depending on what cards you play or how you switch between your alter ego and hero form, she'll be Switching between these different forms, you can choose uh, which ones are best for you, depending on what you're trying to accomplish at that point of the game. And I, I really liked uh, the way that her cards work together. Essentially, if you uh, are already in a form, for instance, you'll get some kind of a bonus. So a card might say, do a bunch of attack damage uh, and then switch to your attack form. But if you're already in it, then your attack also gets overkill. So excess damage spills over uh, to another enemy, stuff like that. And I like that versatility. Actually, that's something I like about both Adam Warlock and Spectrum. Both of their abilities are very different, but essentially allow them to kind of be pretty good all-rounders. Uh, they can do a little bit of thwarting, attacking, defending, depending on what the situation calls for. And that can be really nice, especially uh, if you're a solo player, primarily like I am, uh, and you, if you're doing just true solo, then you don't have to worry as much about having a character who's weak in one area or another. Uh, they can kind of do a little bit of everything, sort of a, a jack-of-all-trades thing. Uh, Spectrum, by the way, is a leader leadership deck, and she's got some cool allies in there, uh, some, of course, unique to her, some that are just uh, generic that you can switch out for other characters. Uh, overall, I liked both of these heroes. I think they're uh, both interesting additions, especially Adam Warlock, if you're interested in deck building uh, and making some weird combos with a bunch of different types of cards. I found him a little bit tougher for me to um, fully embrace, although I did enjoy him. I thought Spectrum was my personal uh, favorite of the two. I think she's a little more straightforward, and it's fun to swap between those forms, and uh, you can feel pretty powerful with some of her cards that are available. So then we'll talk about the villains that are in here, and the, essentially the story of this one, not that it really 
matters. Uh, it goes through an infinity gauntlet type of scenario, pretty close to what you maybe have seen uh, in the cinematic universe, except that they make use of the heroes they've already introduced into the game. So the Guardians are there, Captain Marvel is there, uh, and it starts out a lot like the first Avengers movie with Thanos wanting to come to Earth to grab onto the Infinity Stones. He sends first Ebony Maw, and Ebony Maw's gimmick is that he has spell cards, which are environments that get put in play. And they'll say something like, when the counters run out on this, uh, a bad you have to discard a card at random, or maybe you take a certain amount of damage. So it's a bad thing that's going to happen, but you have time to prepare for it, and you see it getting ready to happen in front of you, uh, which can be annoying, but it's interesting that you have ways to plan for it and manage it. And then after that, you're going to fight Corvus Glaive and Proxima Midnight, and this is two villains, but only one scenario. So each round, it's going to switch off between which one is the primary villain. And in addition to that, you're not just trying to beat them. Uh, their scenario is called Tower Defense, and you are trying to protect Avengers Tower. So a lot of their attacks and things will cause damage to be dealt to Avengers Tower, and if it takes too much, you lose. And that is actually your lose condition in this scenario, uh, not the side schemes or the main schemes that the uh, two villains bring with them. So I actually thought this was kind of a better implementation of um, having multiple villains than even the, the Wrecking Crew scenario that they did before. It's also a little less to keep track of because you only have two villains instead of four all at once. Uh, but uh, kind of a fun, uh, cute one, and I, I like the idea of defending the Avengers Tower. I think it gives you an, an interesting, different kind of a goal to strive for. And then after that, you fight Thanos himself. By the way, there will be minor spoilers if you really want to go into this campaign blind. Uh, but you go up against Thanos as villain number three. And of course, he has the Infinity Gauntlet. And he has all the Infinity Stones at the time that you're fighting him. So there's actually a special separate deck. And sometimes those stones will be flipped out and they have dangerous effects that are going to hurt you and make Thanos stronger. Thanos is also stalwart which means he cannot be stunned or confused, which can be very annoying depending on uh, the types of cards that you're building. Uh, but what's cool also about the Infinity Stones and Gauntlet is that you can give those to any villain. It doesn't have to just be Thanos. You can take those out and give them to anybody. So, you know, whoever eventually gets added, Rhino could grab the Infinity Gauntlet if you really wanted him to, to really spice up uh, different scenarios. Uh, he also has a very cool effect on one of his schemes that sort of simulates the, uh, the Thanos snap. I won't give it away. You can you can find out in the game itself, but it's, uh, I think, an appropriately devastating effect if it comes at the wrong time, which is pretty much any time that it comes because it's not a good thing. There's not a right time for it, I'll be honest. Uh, and then you have two more villains to round it out. It switches from the Thanos theme and moves over to an Asgardian, but still a cosmic level. And you're going up against Hela and Loki, as your final two villains. Hela's whole shtick is that she has captured Odin and you cannot defeat her until you rescue Odin. And then Loki's thing is he has multiple forms. There are actually five different Loki cards rather than having like two or three levels like most villains have. And depending on your difficulty level, you have to take out a certain number of them. And they all have slightly different stats and abilities that, that come in play. Uh, so there's a pretty good variety. I feel like... Ebony Ma is the most sort of uh, kind of basic one of these, which is fine. But the rest of them are, are more gimmicky, uh, a little bit more creative, very thematic. Definitely challenging. Uh, I think not as frustratingly challenging as a lot of people found Galaxy's Most Wanted to be. I never actually finished that campaign, so I can't compare them too directly. But I know a lot of people uh, struggled with it. I think this one feels uh, fairer to me. And if you do play through that campaign, there's also some neat elements in it where you'll be getting new cards, of course, between missions, but also even during the scenario themselves. And uh, one of the ones people will find funny if they're fans of the movies, you get a, there's a shawarma cart that you have to protect. And if you do, everybody gets a shawarma card, which is a nice little resource boost in their deck right away. So you can use that uh, during that game as well as in future games if you're playing through that campaign. And again, of course, you can, uh, you know, mix and match all these different sets. There's a bunch of different encounter sets that I haven't even touched on that you can spread around to different uh, scenarios, just like any of the other ones. So overall, I did have a pretty good time with uh, Mad Titan's Shadow. I think I definitely 
liked it a little more than um, Rise of the Red Skull. And from my experience, probably Galaxy's Most Wanted too. I think this is probably their most impressive big set that's come out yet. Maybe just because personally, I liked both of these heroes a little bit more. And I think the villains are a good mix of interesting gimmicks uh, that are thematic, but not too overly complicated, that they're too weird. They're, they're, some of them do have a bunch of things you need to keep track of, but I didn't find it uh, over the top. And also they're relatively recognizable. I mean, you get Thanos and Loki right in one box. So if, if you're a fan and you like these characters, it's pretty good bang for your buck. The heroes are maybe a little more uh, obscure to, to some fans who aren't as versed in the comics world, uh, Spectrum and Adam Warlock. But I expect that as more Disney Marvel things come out, they'll probably pop up at some point. But I like that too. I like that they're, they're having a mix of familiar characters and new people, kind of like what they've done uh, with most of the Marvel Champions stuff so far. So I think if you're a Marvel Champions uh, hardcore fan, you're going to buy this no matter what. You're probably trying to complete the collection, and I don't think you'll be disappointed. Uh, but I would say if you're somebody who uh, isn't necessarily committed to buying every Marvel Champions thing that comes out, these boxes are usually a really good value, and I think this is one of the better ones, if not the, the best one they've done so far. They've only had three, so it's not saying that much, but I do think they're doing a good job progressively as they've, as they've gone along finding new interesting ways to keep the heroes fresh as well as the scenarios fresh and, and not let the, uh, the scenarios of the game get too stale. So that's Marvel Champions, the Mad Titans Shadow, let me know in the comments if you've had the chance to play this, which of these villains you've enjoyed, uh, if there was any part of the campaign that you particularly struggled with, or maybe you thought it was too easy, you had to up the difficulty, which of course they have options for, and which hero do you prefer, Adam Warlock or Spectrum, or maybe you went through it with some other characters as well, uh, maybe some of the other Guardians or something like that. Talk to me in the comments section below, let me know what you think. Otherwise, that's it for this little expansion review, those are my thoughts. My name is Jonathan and this has been Roll for Crit. Thanks for watching. While you're here, why don't you like the video, subscribe to our channel for more content, or you can check us out on Patreon where if you support us, there are a lot of cool goodies like posting in our Discord channel. We've also got a podcast you can listen to. We have weekly guests, lots of board game discussion. Check that out as well.